Howard Rheingold joins the Plutopia podcast this time. We examine social media, AI and chatbots, media education, good versus bad on the internet, cultural evolution, and tools for thought. The internet and social media uh, is like a, a, um, a tide that lifts all boats. Uh, and that means that the hospital ships and the pirate ships are enabled. If you are the only gay teenager in a small town, or you have a very rare disease that, that only one in a million people have, then, then social media is a lifeline for you. If you're the only Nazi in a small town, you can connect with like-minded souls and, and do bad things. So when I wrote uh, The Virtual Community, when I first wrote the article, Virtual Communities in Whole Earth Review in 1987, the online population was mostly college students and computer scientists and a few early adopters like, like all of us. Now it's a significant percentage of the of the human race. I think it's about I don't know it's about a, a quarter or a, or a fifth of the human population. And with that, um, you're going to get the you're going to get the people who want to do good things and the people who want to do bad things. And it's pretty clear that the ability to do bad things has been uh, vastly amplified. Welcome everybody to the Plutopia News Network podcast. Today, our guest is Howard Rheingo. Howard is a writer, critic, teacher, former editor of Whole Earth Review and the Millennium Whole Earth Catalog, and author of several books, including Virtual Reality, The Virtual Community, and Smart Mobs. I once bought a whole case of copies of Smart Mobs. So welcome, Howard. And I also want to mention that uh, Wendy Grossman, who has been Hanging out with Plutopians lately is also here to ask a few questions. So Howard, how are you? I couldn't be better. Excellent, excellent. I wanted to start by talking about online community a bit because you know you famously wrote the virtual community and and uh, as a participant in virtual communities, especially the well became authoritative on that particular subject. And I'm just kind of wondering what you're thinking about it now, like three decades after the internet uh, mainstream. Well, there, I guess there, there's more than one answer to that, but, but I will say I wrote a piece for my Patreon not long ago, calling for people to create green spaces online. And, and what I m meant by that is um, it doesn't look like the massive platforms like Facebook and Twitter that have really sucked the life out of a lot of uh, communities that existed before then. It doesn't look like they're going to go away. Although at the moment, it looks like Reddit, um, which actually does have a lot of com real communities going there, uh, uh, might be going the way of, of dig. However, given that there are so many inexpensive or free tools available, I am urging people to create a forum. Uh, you could use discourse.org for that, or you could create a, a group blog with, with WordPress, and there are some plugins for WordPress that enable you to do forum-like conversations, or you could have a uh, a Discord or a Slack. Uh, there are all kinds of tools that are available for you and your particular interest group to avail yourselves of the opportunity to, to use online communication within your community without um, the problems both of surveillance capitalism and trolling and all the other awful stuff that, that can happen online. Uh, I think that if we can create a lot of these green spaces um, and they can survive, that uh, eventually I think it will be a, a healthier ecosystem. And so I guess uh, the, the assumption that, that you might be seeing behind this is that things are not so great in the 
the social media world in 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 many ways. And I'll have I'll have to say at the outset that um, this took me a while to understand when I first started looking at the way people use communication technology that the good stuff and the bad stuff are are intertwingled. Um, the, the, the phrase I sometimes use is that the internet and social media uh, is like a, a, um, a tide that lifts all boats. Uh, and that means that the hospital ships and the pirate ships are enabled. If you are the only gay teenager in a small town, or you have a very rare disease that, that only one in a million people have, then, then social media is a lifeline for you. If you're the only Nazi in a small town, you can connect with like-minded souls and, and do bad things. So when I wrote uh, The Virtual Community, when I first wrote the article, Virtual Communities in Whole Earth Review in 1987, the online population was mostly college students and computer scientists and a few early adopters like, like all of us. Now it's a significant percentage of the of the human race. I think it's about I don't know it's about a, a quarter or a, or a fifth of the human population. And with that, um, you're going to get the you're going to get the people who want to do good things and the people who want to do bad things. And it's pretty clear that the ability to do bad things has been uh, vastly amplified. Um, uh, there has been for a while kind of a, an arms race between um, privacy advocates and social media literacy advocates and the, the machinery that, that turns attention into, into dollars. Now, particularly with, with the rise of large language models and, and uh, tools like chat GPT-3, um, the ability to fake people out to um, create uh, computational micro-targeted propaganda um, to suck up uh, all the, the details of your private life and sell them uh, to other people that uh, these are all way, way ahead of uh, efforts to try to counter it. Uh, I wrote a book 10 years ago uh, called Net Smart. Uh, I felt that an answer to the things that are, are going badly with, with online media um, would be um, literacy, knowing how to do it. That, you know, the four of us and a lot of other people, we more or less can can separate the, the, the propaganda from the rest of it. And I said more or less because it's becoming harder and harder for anyone to do that, but there are a whole lot of people out there who just don't don't know the, the basics, and I and I and I don't think it's rocket science. So here we are, ten years later. Is there a widespread education program for people using social media? Are school kids being taught the the the, the difference between um, fake? Uh, media online and real media online. I, I don't. I don't see it. Uh, certainly, there are people doing that, but I, you know, I'll, I'll have to say that I'm, I'm. I'm not too sanguine about the prospects of uh, our side of this of this uh, arms race. Yeah, I wonder who would take the charge there to educate kids. You would think that it would be included in curricula from elementary forward really but i as you say i don't think that's happening well there there are some reasons for that and and one of them is that uh the idea of critical thinking of teaching kids to question assumptions and and try to think for themselves was long ago um identified as a communist plot uh, I know this because my mother was a school teacher and we're talking, you know, uh, 50, 60 years ago when she was teaching, she got in a lot of trouble uh, for that. And, and, you know, I think it's um, it's not difficult uh, to figure out why. 
it's really not easy to be a teacher or a parent if you encourage your kids to question authority. Uh, so you know you don't you don't have to to think that it's a communist plot to not uh, really be comfortable with what you have to do to teach kids to think critically. I've been thinking about that question authority thing though. Uh, that that there's a couple of ways to do it. I mean, you can be smart about questioning authority and do it critically, but then you have these people on the right. QAnon questions authority, you know, uh, but they're crazy. I mean. They're coming from a place of, uh, of I, I hate to call anybody insane, but I think they're coming from a place of insanity. And they're asking the same kind of questions. Just, you know, you'll recall that I had a thing called fringeware many years ago. This was early internet stuff. And, and we had that insight that in every community around the country, there could be people who you know, like in little towns, whatever, there could be people who are kind of thinking outside the box and they don't have anybody else they can talk to, but with the internet, they can connect to people that that understand them and will align with them. But as you know, as you suggested, that also worked for people who were, I don't know how to characterize it, maybe, less healthy and productive in their thinking about what they wanted to do. People who were were um, uh, somewhat troubled and finding other troubled people to make trouble. Yeah, well, um, you know, we could spend the whole whole hour talking about the, the, the things that um, that have gone wrong, um, you know, sexual harassment. Uh, sexual uh, predation, um, uh, uh, racist and anti-Semitic uh, organized uh, brigading uh, of people. Uh, there's just, there's a, a litany of stuff that goes, goes wrong. Uh, I'll have to say though, again, at the same time, the global response to pandemics would, would not have been possible um, without the internet and, and social media. Uh, I mentioned if you have a disease that only one in a million people have, well, there are 2 billion people online. That means there are 2,000 others online uh, who have that disease. So it's it's a lifeline and it's, it's, it's a threat uh, at the same time. And I, I think, you know, if we're going to try to learn any lessons from this going forward, I think you, you need to kind of think proactively about where new social communication technologies in particular could go wrong. And uh, I can't uh, attribute this. It might be Ethan Zuckerman, but um, I'm not sure. But someone recently said a good thing, a way to think about um, new technologies, new social technologies is what would 4chan do with it? Um, and so, you know, uh, I think now we're beginning to think about where are we going with AI? I think that's a good question to, to raise there. I, I don't really have the expertise to have a judgment on whether um, general artificial intelligence is, is going to be an existential threat uh, to humans, but uh, it certainly can be a powerful tool for bad actors. Um, and you know, so what do you do about that? Well, how about thinking about that in advance? Not that I have an answer, other than, you know, we ought to think about it. Uh, there ought to be, as there is a, a more of a public discourse about where AI may be heading. Uh, Howard, I have to give credit to you with my early education online. I believe you had a BBS and I got onto it and uh, transgressed. <laughs> and you gave me a, a very pithy uh, comeback of, how you were supposed to behave online. It wasn't, you know, nasty or anything. It was just a straight, you don't do these, you don't promote your products on my BBS. And I kept those uh, words, to, I took them to heart and they saved me many times in my later endeavors online. I have to thank you for that. Because both people in the early days really didn't have any clue of what you could do, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, what was good manners, what was bad manners. And it was nice of you to share that. 
Well, norms um, are ways that populations can enforce behavioral rules with, without having a law or or law enforcement. It's like, uh, you know, people frown uh, at you, even strangers, if you don't clean up your dog poop on the on the sidewalk uh, while they're watching. That's a that's a norm. Uh, there is a, a famous uh, incident, Wikipedia, I think it, well, I, I know it as the September that never ended. I think it's eternal September on, on Wikipedia, but Usenet used to have norms. Usenet being this kind of global BBS system without going into any detail that had tens, of, if not hundreds of thousands of people in the world participating and they had some norms. One of the norms was before you ask questions of experts, read our frequently asked questions. Uh, don't type in all caps. Don't don't try to flog your your commercial product. Um, the old timers would pass along the norms to newcomers, and and often not in a, a polite way. And then uh, AOL. Uh, put three million people on the internet one night without any kind of instruction on on norms, and it it became impossible for the old timers to to educate the the newcomers. So I think that there's there and you know we're we're seeing the deterioration of norms on uh, on Twitter now. Uh, it's you really can't in, enforce norms when there's actually no real uh, sanctions for the worst offenders. Well, the other problem is that you, somebody comes along who doesn't care about norms like Elon Musk or like Trump, and the system of relying on norms breaks. And what you hope that whoever's in charge of the U.S. is doing is, is making it harder to break those norms. Yeah, I'm afraid that also connects with this business of there, there being so much misinformation and, and disinformation out there. And um, and that's being embraced by authoritarian political movements around the world. And if you, if you go back to the last chapter of the virtual community, which is 1992, I don't know, was, was that 25, 30 years ago? Um, I, I called it disinformocracy. And I tried to, to, to foresee the different ways that things could go wrong. And one of them I really got from, from Guy Debord, who, who wrote The Society of the Spectacle, and Jean Baudrillard, who, who wrote about simulations, which is the idea that as our media become better and better at faking reality, we begin to live in a an unreality, in, in a, uh, a, a simulation um, that's, that is, created not by most people, but by by people who have the means to to manipulate uh, what we believe. And, and, and what we're seeing in terms of norms is, uh, you mentioned QAnon, just it's 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 not just that there are false things happening. It's that the, the beliefs in, in, in reality are, are are beginning to be fogged and um, I don't know where that's going to go. How, how do you teach people to fact check if there are so many unfacts disguising as facts? Alternate facts. Alternate facts. You know, you know, people quote do their own research about things like vaccines, and they come up with all kinds of bogus material to back it up. So I think, you know. Uh, I was one of many who celebrated the kind of the, the fragmentation of the monopoly on attention that the internet brought. I mean, we used to have in the US three uh, major uh, television networks and um, you know th three or four major newspapers and a fairly small number of people dictated the, the news and a large number of people got every day and then suddenly every desktop and, and now every telephone can broadcast and and be a, a, a site of information and many-to-many -many communications have been a, a great 
boon and also part of this this fogging of of reality uh that's going on uh i don't know the answer uh it sounds like we need a way to watermark reality like we do in certain files of it it's hard to tell what's real anymore because it's so if you will realistic in its development i mean you know anti-vaxxers um they have some uh reality to deal with there are unknown things about uh, uh vaccines um but then you've got flat earthers uh who are you know the, the the internet and social media have given them a, a, a great opportunity to connect with each other and, and have a platform it's just it's really weird what what uh it, it's scary what people believe because you know it, it used to be that people thought that plagues were caused by by foreigners or or jews poisoning the well or 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 witches um when it was discovered that if you boiled your water and killed the, the dangerous microorganisms in it, your, your kids wouldn't die. We had a reality to deal with, the, you know, the, the, the reality of, of the, the scientific process. Uh, and that's, that's coming under attack as well. Yeah, there was so much more respect for that. But now scientific process is being viewed by some people the way we used to view superstition, you know, as unreliable and even hazardous. Um, you know, at the same time, I, I talked about green space. Uh, there, this doesn't mean that, that people have stopped uh, doing uh, good things about improving the, the, the internet. Um, I, just, I just see that the, the bad stuff is, is um, so appalling that it, it gets all the attention. But it's sort of like what Joanna Bryson uh, was saying about AI, that it's it's a tool. It's it's a thing that you use and we shouldn't start thinking of it as a human thing, but we should remember that it's created by humans and operated by humans. And really, you got to look at the humans. The AI is not responsibility when it, not responsible when it screws up. The human who made the AI is responsible when it screws up. And I think that's also true of the Internet. I mean, the Internet is a tool. We built the tool and it like a shovel. You can use a shovel to dig a hole. You can also use it to bludgeon your neighbor. And uh, either use is possible. How do you ensure that the. That the. Uh, digging of the hole is seen as the correct use. It's a moral question, I think. Yeah, you know, if it's uh, if you try to, to dig down to the foundations of, of this, it, it really comes down to fun fundamental religious beliefs about who people are. Um, are humans uh, born in sin and, and have to be uh, saved from it and disciplined from it? Or are humans born neutral and and are shaped by our culture and our environment and i don't think we're ever going to see a day or nor really should we see the day when there's a, a universal uh agreement about that but i'll have to say just just to go back to this discussion about AI, which I don't really know a great deal about. But, you know, if it wasn't for the Internet and social media, we would not have large language models. Where do you think they got the large language from? It's from all of the things that all of us have put on the Internet. And so, yes, it's a tool. But, you know, they used to think AI consisted of making programs that could do tasks like recognize vision and and, and speech. It turned out um, when Google started using CAPTCHAs that they were able to train their, their visual uh, recognition by using the byproduct of, of human activity and large language models can consist are, are kind of the, 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 the molecules, the elements of them are everything on the internet including a lot of bad stuff, including a lot of uh, art that was created by people who didn't give permission for it to be 
used. I, I think it's too late to argue about things like copyright in that respect, but I think we have to understand that this tool is not only a tool that humans use, but it's it's made from humans. It's made from, from human activity and the, the computer uh, part of it really wouldn't be able to do what it does without all the things that people do. I have to bring up the uh, naughty elephant in the room. If you think back of how things uh, online became popular, email, the web, uh, Usenet, it, it was uh, well known among folks like us who got early on to computing and such. But when porn became available on these channels, then it went through the roof. And now I see that the makers of realistic sex dolls are going to start, they claim, putting AI into the sex dolls. And that, that made my mind just kind of melt down. But that seems to be the way all of these technologies have become ultra popular, not through you know, learned discourse, but the arrival of porn. Teledildonics. <laughs> yeah. I, think reason, I seem to recall that the reason VHS was more successful than beta was that Sony was very prudent, uh, not prudish about having, allowing porn to be on beta. But that's not the only reason things became popular. I mean, you know, Usenet had a lot, a lot of stuff on it that wasn't porn. You know, it's just if you're counting by this by images versus text, obviously in terms of traffic, it's going to swamp the server. And I recall that the University of Delft had a particularly large archive of porn in the in the early '90s, and they had to take it down because it was it was most of the traffic to the university. Well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat neutral on the, on the, on the porn issue. Is it, is it harmful? Is it not harmful? I don't know. What we do know is that uh, child sexual abuse and exploitation of images of it are in a golden age with, with the, the internet as we know it. And uh, I, I have no evidence of it, but I've heard that um, that recently that, that it's exploded a lot on Twitter. I mean, I, I've seen porn on Twitter, but I haven't seen the child abuse uh, part. So, you know, there's I think that's maybe one thing that almost every human agrees on that we, we shouldn't uh, uh, sanction anything that amplifies the ability for, for people to abuse children. Clearly, uh, that's that's not working in some ways. Although I, I, you know, I don't know about the efforts to to catch those people, and I, and, and I certainly uh, suspect that there are uh, a lot of them. Again, this is we're kind of getting into a litany of all the ways that things have have gone wrong online. Uh, I, I think it's good to face that. Um, I think it's also good to understand that that if you take that away, you're going to take away a lot of uh, important, uh, useful stuff. I, I think science and, and, and medical science um, would, would be hamstrung uh, without it. Well, we've, we've both been, and probably all of us have been members of communities that are interesting and productive and uh, cordial, you know, <clears throat> sometimes there's flame wars, but often cordial. Uh, I know the well has been a big part of my life, and I know yours for for decades now. And uh, I've made some relationships there that are like lifelong friendships, even with people that I never see. I, I met a 30 year friend the other day face to face for the first time. It was somebody that I met on the well. Um, so the Internet gives us a platform that allows us to transcend geography and allows us to connect with people that where we can form bonds and we can form friendships and we can also do productive work and creative work online. So there's so much good that comes from the Internet, and I tend to think it vastly outweighs the bad stuff. It's hard not to think about the bad stuff, especially right now, because it's kind of in our face. but. It, but it has been, I think, a, a great net positive. You know, I just I read a very interesting article that was published 
quite recently. The title is What, what Makes Us Smarter? And uh, Joe Henrich, H-E-N-R-I-C-H, was the principal author of it. And he said, that, you know, it, it's not particularly our, our big brains that, that uh, have enabled humans to build what no other species has, has been able to create. It's our um, talent and, um, and I guess hunger for, uh, for connection and communication and forming networks and using those networks to leverage learning. So, you know, in biological evolution, if a, a creature has a, a slightly better ability to see or, or uh, some other trait, then over millions of years, the descendants of, of that creature will, will come to dominate. Um, with cultural evolution, if somebody discovers how to make a fire, they can teach everybody else in the tribe and everybody else in, in the future of that tribe knows how to make fire. And then you know what? A second person might come along and say, you know, if you put your meat on the fire and cook it, um, it's, it's gonna be a lot easier to digest. And then everybody knows that. So cultural evolution does operate in a similar way to Darwinian evolution, but much, much faster. And it happens through two things. It happens through social networks and communication networks. And it also happens through teaching. So in some ways, we are um, we are the spe species that, that teaches. So what we're talking about now, the use of the internet and the evolution of social media is really a, a connection, uh, a, a, an extension of that. And, and it, it really brings, you know, I, I, I call my book Smart Mobs in the year 2000. And I really wish I had explicitly stated that a smart mob is not necessarily a wise mob, although I, I did write about uh, the, the dangers of it. Being smarter does not necessarily mean you're going to be a good person. The, the leader of the Nazi mobile killing squads had two PhDs. Uh, so we're getting smarter. How do, how do we get wiser or how how does whatever wisdom we have how, how is it deployed in a way that that somehow it, it can can buffer or or even win over the the tide of antisocial uh behavior yeah and humans are good at evolving but sometimes our evolution is not so good like the the drone used to be a little kid toy now they have weapons, they bomb, they kill. And uh, a, a number of other technologies have been that way as well. The airplane was a charming little thing that flew around till they realized you could drop a bomb from it. So there's this evolution. I don't know if that's evolution or devolution. <laughs> well, uh, I think it, it's, it's clear that a phone, I mean, a, a plane that can be used in warfare is intelligent it's not necessarily humane. And so, you know, I think we we need to make that distinction that, that becoming smarter does not necessarily make everything better. I think we, we want smarter doctors. We want smarter builders of transportation uh, technologies, uh, but making everybody smarter is not going to make the world necessarily a better place. Yeah, one of the first things you wrote about was tools for thought. And uh, I think you were writing about computers and how they can amplify our capabilities, our, our ability to think and our ability to learn. But there's also the question of whether we can use computers to amplify our wisdom. You know, there, there have been people who tried and there's a conference that the name of which escapes me at the moment in, in which people try to get together to, to talk about things like that. There was um, a couple of decades ago, there's a, a couple by the name of Peter and Trudy Johnson Lenz, who um, they invented the word uh, groupware and they, uh, they had their own server and they called it awakening technology. And they used to have kind of Sangha-like meetings uh, in which people tried to share at a, at a deeper level. And, you know, clearly there are, are many ways that, that people do share at a deeper level. When you're talking about 
people um, who are caregivers for people with Alzheimer's or people um, who have cancer, the discussions that they have are a, a lot deeper often uh, than, than what you see in, in, in more so superficial places. Uh, you know, uh, my, I, my ideas uh, that led to, to Tools for Thought really came from my encounter for, with, with Doug Engelbart, who had a heck of a time convincing people that computers should be or could be used to, to think and, and communicate. And he had, uh, in addition to the things that his team invented, he had this framework he called HLAMT, Humans Using Language Artifacts, Methodology, and Training. And in our, our conversations over the years since Tools for Thought, he, he, he often pointed out that, that the artifacts are literally millions of times more powerful than, than what he had uh, in the 1960s. But the, the, the methodology and the training uh, really hasn't gone along with that. And I, I think that connects to my, uh, what I had to say about literacy, that having a powerful tool is going to be used differentially by people who know how to use it and, and people who don't know how to use it. And again, I'm, I'm not sanguine about there being a mass education about it, but if you, on a theoretical level, if you talked about what can we, we do about these powerful tools that can be misused, I think educating people about how to use them is one thing that can be done and is relatively inexpensive. Yeah, it occurs to me that this problem we have, we, we, I think we do have a significant problem with propaganda. I mean, I should state that up front. And I think that I, the way to address that problem is not on the transmission side, but on the receiving side. If you can make people smart enough to spot the manipulation and, and, uh, and you can neutralize it thereby, then that sort of defuses the bomb. I, I think I'm going to disagree with that. Uh, okay. I, I think I think of the prof promulgation of disinformation and misinformation online as a problem as complex as computer security. And to solve computer security, which we haven't managed to do, uh, you need everything. You need educated users, but you also need better design and you need ways to create friction that make it harder for the attacker to, to spread misinformation or to hack into your system. Uh, one of the big mistakes in security is when people say people are the weakest link. That's often true, but the answer is not to fix the user, not necessarily to fix the users, because the, you don't want to blame the, the user for being fooled. You want to make it easier for them to say report something that they're not certain about, or to spot things, or you want to choke it off at the source. I mean, you, you, you ha yes, it's it's great to say yes, people should be educated, but you, but you have to meet them. Part well, I don't think that would be blaming the user for being fooled. It's more like making the user less likely to be fooled. Well, yeah, but you know, it's an arms race. Yeah, understood. Yeah, and and we the we the humans are seem to be losing it. But you know, um, education is an institution. Learning is something that humans do. And whether or not it, it revolutionizes education, clearly um, the internet has revolutionized learning. If, if you ask a 14 year old anywhere in the world, um, how do you learn to configure a web server, play a ukulele, um, scuba dive, uh, they're going to say they're going to say, "Oh, I'll do a search on on YouTube." Uh, until pretty recently, uh, schools had the monopoly on on learning, uh, except for you know a few dedicated autodidacts. You wanted to learn, you had to go to school. Now you've got the the lectures of the best universities in the world. You've got all the texts you could possibly want. You've got communication media. Uh, like forums and and chat. Now we're 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 seeing people using Chat GPT as a as a, a tutor. The 
the tools and the material, yes, is, is that a good idea or not? Um, that's a good question. Well, um, I think, again, if you know what you're doing. So um, my, my daughter designs um, mobile learning uh, uh, content. Uh, it's a combination of chat bots and, and Slack and, and video conference. She is um, amplifying her ability to use that by using chat GPT, by saying, you're an instructional designer and these are the ideas you need to get across. Then of course, she knows what she's doing so she can throw out the bad stuff and use the good stuff. Again, it's the methodology and training part of it. It's a flawed tool, but if you understand how to use the flaws then you can get ahead with it. But anyway, to get back to that, Peer-to-peer -peer learning online is something that happens every day um, for millions of people. That, that's something that just didn't happen uh, before. What we don't really have is a widespread understanding about how, how do you go about doing it. So I, that's 2011, I, I created something called Peeragogy. If you go to peeragogy.org, P-E-E-R, agogy.org. I started this, but I really dropped out of that community a few years ago, and, and it has been taken up by people around the world to create a handbook for peer learning. So one of the things that I am uh, pretty optimistic about is the potential of the internet for people to learn both within, but, but mostly outside of the educational institutions. It's funny, it reminded me, I often compare the internet to the Junior Woodchuck's guidebook. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah that was Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Yeah, and Huey, Dewey, and Louie would refer to that, and they found the answer to any question that came up in the Junior Woodchuck's guidebook. The internet is just like that, but you can also find a lot that's not correct or not true. And this, you know, this comes up a bit in, um, I've worked some with, you know, the participatory medicine patient communities thing. And in patient communities, amazing things can happen. Patients can become a kind of like group mind about their condition. And, you know, each person is different. So each person has maybe a different manifestation of a particular disease. And if you bring a lot of those people together, they can derive real insights about therapies that it, it would be hard to create in any other kind of environment and they can conduct research together and so forth, but they can also spread misinformation about the condition and they can, uh, they can scare the hell out of each other about the condition. So there's always a potential downside. And I guess this is just a struggle. It's a wicked problem. It's a struggle we're always, always gonna have between the smart use of things and the less smart use of things. Well, I've always felt that a peer medic, uh, medical community for people with ailments would be much better if it in included some paid medical authorities, doctors and, and nurses, and, and, you know, just maybe a pool of consultants that you could, you know, have, remember that, uh, that in, what was it, Annie Hall, the Woody Allen movie where he pulled Marshall McLuhan in to, to yeah. uh, I think having the ability to have people on tap who, have good credentials to about their particular specialty who can be called into a conversation like that that would be like having the moderator rods in a nuclear reactor to keep the the bad stuff from running out of control um don't you or, think don't you think though that if you wanted to, if you want to look back that peer-to-peer -peer learning did exist before the internet I, I mean i think of aa for example as as a as an example of peer-to-peer -peer learning Absolutely, um, absolutely. And um, you know, a lot of the uh, education of freed uh, slaves in the US happened on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. It, I think it was each one teach one was what, what they they called it. Right. Again, you know, the, the internet simply amplifies that. I, I came across a cool story. A friend of mine has written a book on how vaccines work. And he's got a story in it about variolation, which was an early form of vaccination. That was like giving somebody cowpox instead of smallpox to, to combat smallpox. 
that actually the tr that uh, technique was spread in Boston because a woman asked her slave <laughs> why he hadn't gotten smallpox. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, there's a uh, movement in some parts of this country, Texas, where we are, uh, particularly parent empowerment taking over the uh, educational uh, the education of, of children is considered uh, endangered because the parents don't have a say in what they're teaching so they're they're banning books they're banning courses of study that they figure will uh, upset the children and that's something that just scares the hell out of me because all it takes is a bunch of uh, clueless parents getting in charge to send a whole generation off into the dustbin. It, it turns out that it's 11 of them, that almost all of these book banning uh, laws have been pushed by 11 parents. Uh, amazing. Well, th the story I read was that there are 11 parents who filed the, most of the complaints but they're not necessarily filing them just on their own behalf, that, that other people are happy for them to file for them and, and take the heat. So I'm not clear that it's really just 11 people who want these things banned. On the other hand, uh, you know, it's very frustrating to watch, particularly, you know, from outside the country. You sort of look at and say, you guys crazy now? Yeah. yeah, I've been thinking about this. I kind of tried to, I've tried to kind of see the parents' side of this where they they have a feeling that, what's happening with their kids is something that's outside their control and they want to get more control over it, right? They're afraid their kids are being taught things that they really don't want them to learn. And I think there is a valid question about the the parent's role and what input a parent should be able to have. And it's hard for us to address that when Oh, this Steve Bannon thing, you know, he talks about flood the zone with shit. Well, they're flooding the zone. There's there's a lot of very sort of emotional, reactive discussion about banning books versus parental like involvement uh, and whether parents should be able to remove books and so forth. But I think one question is, what role should a, a parent have in their child's education and to what extent should that education be divorced from uh, what the parents uh, desire? Boy, that's that's another one of your wicked problems. I, I, I know it's hard. I don't have an, an answer to that, but I do remember from my own experience, um, that when these kids learn that they have been misled, they're not going to believe a lot of things that they really ought to believe. So the our generation, boomers generation, you know, it turned out that um, we found out that the conditions for African Americans in our country were a lot worse than, than we saw on, on television. And that Maybe the United States wasn't always right when we went to war and that marijuana is not going to kill you. Well, that generalized into people taking drugs that destroy their lives and uh, people making a lot of, uh, well, just the, the rebellion that we saw really came, I think, from not just righteous indignation about the injustices, but what happens when you feel like people have been pulling the, 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 the wool over your eyes, um, especially if they're your parents? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that everyone who is being miseducated is going to see the light, but um, it's, it's really hard to keep adults from having access to, to that kind of material. Yeah, I experienced that whole thing of learning how bad race relations were when I was a child in our hometown where John and I grew up. The courthouse, the county courthouse, had drinking fountains that were labeled white and colored. 
And I didn't know what that meant. I went up to the colored one. I was going to get a drink. And the sheriff comes up behind me, grabs me by the, house, the shoulder because he was out there talking to my dad. He said, you can't do that. Don't you understand? And I, I didn't understand. And he tried to explain it to me, but not really explain it to me. And it took me asking my mom, what was that all about? And, well, that's only for those other folks, the colored folks. I, what color? And it just, you know, so that, that conversation spiraled out of control. But that's when I learned that there were different treatments for different people. I'm a little younger than you are. So, you know, I kind of, I kind of, I think I went through a lot of my life thinking that a lot of race relations had improved a lot. And one of the things that I really learned in the five years, last five years on Twitter, up, when I said the last five years, up until November 2022, I kind of, I kind of have a cutoff when, when Musk took over, was, you know, that you, in the States, at least, you don't call police if there's a black person present because they could end up dead. And I had never known that. And so there's, there's a lot still that I think if you live, you know, in, in a somewhat privileged life, you don't see. Yeah. And I think, you know, particularly if you're a kid, it's pretty easy to, to, to enclose uh, your world. Um, I just think that you can't keep doing that forever. I got to tell you, that's been hitting me really hard lately. There's just so much that, I mean, you know, over the years, you you become more and more aware of your own privilege, really. And uh, I have led a very privileged life, and I never, it never occurred to me, you know. And and late in life, suddenly, I'm aware of how much privilege I've had, and uh, and you know, the irony of it is that I see a bunch of people now, like the GOP MAGA people wanting to deny that, wanted to deny any discussion of privilege or of like systemic racism or any of those things. And the internet should open those doors for people, but they're also using the internet in some cases pretty effectively to slam those doors. Another wicked problem. Well, you know, there's one kind of nice thing happening at the moment. Um, in the background, I've got some pictures on from the Miami courthouse where Trump is appearing. And there are protesters outside. And some of them are for Trump and some of them are against Trump. And nobody's hitting anybody. They all seem to be milling around peacefully. And, you know, that's a start, right? Yeah, I've been thinking about that as well. And I think uh, the fact that so many people have been uh, prosecuted and and sentenced for their role in January 6th that that the uh, the people who were were brave then uh, about uh, showing up to to cause trouble are they're not inclined to want to be identified because they know if they break the law they might they might be busted for it so I think that there's boy that there's we're getting kind of far afield here, but I think that there, there are two things that are, are kind of, you know, pulling at each other, which is the the institutions of, of law, which are often imperfect and even unjust, are really the, the only bulwark that a, uh, a democracy has against the, the, the mob. And that uh, at the same time, we've got these these militias and uh, and con con conspiracy groups that are are, are ready to, to go violent, um, having more and more rhetoric. So clearly, the rhetoric creates an atmosphere in which violence can happen. But we're also seeing maybe some of the dampening of that that violence. Um, I read something uh, yesterday about people mistaking uh, popular. Uh, uprisings for revolutions that that revolutions only happen when the the military goes along with it with the populace that that in in, in France in 1789 and in in, um, in Russia in 1917 that if if the the 
law enforcement and and armed forces had not gone over to the side of the people, then you know it doesn't matter how many um, rednecks with guns you've got; they're not going to defeat the the, the military. So um, yeah, I read that too. So, so our hope is that the military is not on board with the Proud Boys. Well, well, you know. Some and evidently them. it's not. I sure surely there's people in the military who are on board with that, but in general, I don't think that they're you know I don't think we should worry about that. One comment on Twitter right after January sixth was well, after after Biden took office was that one thing he could do by an executive order is he could stop the playing of Fox News continuously on military bases and that that would be actually a helpful thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you know, people want to blame the internet for everything, but really, if you look at the influence of Rupert Murdoch and Fox News and, and his control over the Australian local press and, you know, the Times and the Sun in Britain and the New York Post and the Wall Street Journal in the U.S., I mean, that is really a much bigger problem. Well, you've got Rupert Murdoch and you've got Vladimir Putin and you've got, I mean, you've got a lot of people who have a kind of autocratic sensibility and who have a lot of money and who, you know, who really, they don't want a level playing field. They, they don't want equality. They don't want democracy, any of those things. But, but I think to bring it back around to kind of what we were talking about originally and, and uh, you know, our subject of discussion, I wonder what we as people who are professionals who have been involved with the internet for a long time and who understand social media and who understand online community and who understand communication to some extent, what can we be doing now? How, how, can, we, how can we try to undo some of the polarization that we're experiencing? How do we fix the world? <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't have an answer to that one, but but I, I really think it would be useful for uh, the Office of Technology Assessment to be reconstituted. In 1986, I participated in a study that they had about the future of uh, communications. So 1986, future of communications. Uh, it's, the report is online. It's called Critical Connections. And they did a really good job of bringing a real cross section of experts and citizens from all parts of the country and all parts of the political spectrum from cities and the country and 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 facilitated some some very useful discussions. The people who were in the audience for that and the people who read the reports were the 20 something aides to to Congress who told them what, according to their values, they how they ought to, to think about different issues. It was a pretty small budget, something like $20 million, and it was zeroed out by, by the, the Gingrich Congress. I think it's become much more clear to the population and even to Congress that the issues of technology have everything to do with governance and the economy and health and, and, and education, and that uh, they don't know very much about it. I mean, very, very few of them. I, you know, Al Gore got a, a bad deal because he was one of the, the only people in the Senate who really understood what the potential of the internet was. I, I don't think we can hope to, <coughs> nor should we, uh, hope to elect Community, uh, you know, political leaders who are primarily technology experts, but they certainly ought to have some expertise other than the lobbyists telling them what the effects, in a nonpartisan way, of uh, new technologies, particularly new co communication technologies, might be. So we have a few minutes. We have a few minutes left. Uh, if we had this conversation a year from now. How, how do you think it may have changed between now and a year from now, the things we've been talking about? Well, I think one thing we're seeing with, with the large language models is that um, AI, which um, took, 
decades is 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 accelerating and that in the next year it's it's going to be a lot more powerful and you know we saw you know i talked about engelbart saying that you know several decades later the artifacts were millions of times uh, more powerful the the large language models come in versions and and they're going to be increasingly powerful and people using them and figuring out what goes wrong with them and and how to how to make them work more efficiently that that's certainly going to happen and here in in san francisco so many of the the people who left san francisco be, because it's expensive and and uh they could work remotely from other parts of the world they're coming here because of the ai wave so you know the the, the bay area silicon valley it, it really is a a, a a cycle where the bust of one technology based economy seeds the the boom of the next one you know starting with video games when you know video games and personal computers and the the internet and mobile telephones and now now we've got ai happening and they're, they're calling the hayes valley here cerebral valley because that's where all the startups are and i'm getting all these invites to where they're inviting 200 300 400 500 people to these these forums about it so there's a lot happening right now in in a ferment around the ai business and 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 i think a year from now we're, we're gonna we're, we're going to see a lot coming from that and, you know we already have this the the release of uh chat gpt was just a few months ago and now we're, we're seeing just dozens and dozens of of apps and and um plugins that, that that people are are coming up with. So that's I think that's the one thing that can be said with with confidence. Uh so AI is a catalyst for a lot of activity and and I believe that if we were to get another office of technology assessment or a similar thing, it will probably be because AI has spooked people. Yeah. As it, as it should. Um it's a, I think all the things we're talking about illustrate that that shiny new tools that, that, that enrich people's lives and make people's fortunes some years down the line turn out to, to have a a, 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 a seamy side to them let's let's start thinking about that a little bit earlier not, not that not that i know what the answer is but i think not talking about it is a problem so howard we're at the end of our hour um so I think we have to wrap up, uh, but we really appreciate you joining us today and we hope you'll come back again. Well, of course, you know, we really didn't talk very much about the, the mechanics of online communities. And how, I, think how, that's, how I know, that's why, I, that's what I think we can talk about the next time. Yeah, definitely. Great, good. If you're, if you're willing to come back, we'll invite you back in a, in a few always, weeks. Always for you, John. Oh, thank you so much. Nice to see you all. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.